Hello and welcome to Color Multimedia Enterprises. My name is Luke, also known as Tianery, and I am back with some tutorials. You might be wondering what this tutorial is going to be about. It is going to be about hakes specifically. It is going to be about just the general idea of getting into hakes, what it is, and why you would want to use it. And I think the best way to start is by showing you the code and the process of programming in Hakes. Now, there's a reason why I have been wanting to do these tutorials. I did a vlog a few months ago, um, quite a while ago now. I did say I wanted to do some uh, Hakes tutorials and never got around to doing it at that time. I was very busy with my life back then, but right now I'm a little bit better, let's put it that way. So without further ado, I am going to get started. Now if you don't have Hakes Develop or Flash Develop, this is the program I'm going to be using. You don't have to use it, but what I will be doing is I will be showing you Hakes Develop, so I am going to go over. I clicked on, so if I cancel out of this again. So this is what the main interface looks like when you first launch it. If you go over to the projects pane over here, to the right hand side of the screen, it says create new project, and that's what I clicked on. We've got here a few options. So we've got these options such as Flash Project, Air Projector, JS Project, I actually don't know what that Air Projector is all about, uh, Nico Project, Python, PHP. So basically all of the possible targets that are available, as well as a few frameworks are also available as pre-installed by Hakes Develop. You can of course add new templates if you want to some developers provide them like luke's for example um, and various other frameworks out there but for the time being i'm just going to select nico project and i am going to put in nico tutorial now there is a quite a big difference between the two uh, between all of these different uh, targets but for now i'm going to be not targeting nico because that is a very simple target, it's very easy to use, and it's not particularly difficult. Okay, so what can Nico do? What can Nico do? For those of you who do not know what Nico is, it is a Japanese cat. No, I'm being serious. It is <laughs> it is the Japanese word for cat, but to be more specific about the programming side of things when it comes to hakes nico is in fact a virtual machine made by the very people who created hakes also known as the hakes foundation and what this virtual machine does is it is a very similar it's very similar to java in the sense that it has its own language it has a virtual machine that's what i wanted to say um, and it also has its own runtime, right? And you can do lots of different things. It's a lot faster than Java. It's even faster for the web. And you can make rich applications using OpenFL with it as well. Um, but in this tutorial, I am going to be explaining the basics of Nico. I'm going to be explaining the basics of Hakes, why you would want to use it, and simply where to go from there okay so for those of you just starting out with hakes you're probably wondering where do i start what do i do and how do i program in this language one of the first things that you should be aware of is if you have done any programming before whether it's in c c plus plus javascript even action script you will notice that Hakes is very similar to JavaScript and ActionScript 3, more specifically. In fact, I would give ActionScript 3 
more of the edge in terms of similarities between hakes and those languages that i've just mentioned because it ha it shares a lot of functionality with action script 3 now if you haven't used action script 3 don't worry i will teach you that's the whole point of these tutorials now before we begin i am going to explain to you how every program works in the history of programming if you don't know how programs work i will tell you this right now in any project that you create with any programming language it doesn't matter what it is c c plus plus c sharp java php any of them well maybe not every single one but most of them if you're creating a binary executable right which is basically an exe or anything that you double click on that launches and brings up a GUI or some something like that there is always going to be a main entry point what is a main entry point what does that even mean for those of you who are not tech savvy a main entry point is basically a point in the program that tells the computer this is what you need to start executing it is telling the computer that when I double click on that exe, it is telling Windows to basically execute that main function. Now, specific types as well. You need to specify with the compiler what, where the main entry point is and what it's going to execute. So. In order to demonstrate what the main execution point is, I am going to simply type in trace hello world. We all love the hello world, don't we? <laughs> very cliche, very overused, but we're still going to do it anyway. Um, <laughs> so if we now go to... Uh, I'm not going to use any of those. Thank you very much. I am going to delete those because I do not like the um, things that it normally comes with. Now, what I'm going to do is I am going to create a new TXT file, but I'm going to add an extension to it. And I am going to call it build.hxml. Build.hxml, what is that? It is basically uh, an X, well, it's not an XML file. It is a series of commands that tells Hakes, the Hakes compiler, what to do when we double click on that. So, what I'm going to do is put in dot dash cp src. What does that mean? Dash cp basically means look in this directory for source files. Where are the source files? It is in the src directory, which is this folder over here which I just double clicked on and it expanded and this is the main file now I haven't told it what the main entry point is so I might need to do that main main now I've specified the main entry point so what the dash main is doing is it is telling the hex compiler this is the main class that I want you to execute right so you do not need to add dot hx at the end you don't need to do that because Hakes understands its own language, obviously, otherwise it won't compile. Another thing we also need to do is specify where the generated file needs to go. So in this case, I am going to do dash Nico, which is the target file that I'm targeting to. to tar Let me try that again. <laughs> dash Nico is the target that i want to build to nico being the virtual machine i want to make it main.n let's put it in the bin directory shall we just to make things a bit clearer now the bin directory already exists so it's not going to create it but if it didn't exist the hex compiler it will create that folder anyway for us so we won't need to do anything else 
So let's save that. Now trace, what does that do? That basically prints the line, hello world. This is a string, which is a series of characters, alphanumeric characters. So let's go ahead and build. So what I'm going to do is right click on the project at the top. I'm going to go over the command prompt. And I am going to type in hakes build.hxml. I'm going to press enter and then it's going to build and that built very, very quickly. Very quickly. So now it has generated a .n file. If I double click, oh, <laughs> might not want to do that. Now, you might have noticed something. When I click on execute, it comes up and then it goes away straight away. Why does it do that? Because we did not say to keep the window open. In order to keep the window open, we need to do something specific. But before I go ahead and do that, let me right click on that bin folder, go to command prompt, and, and then what I'm going to do is I am going to type in Nico main.n. Now Nico is another, or actually it's not Nico, it's Nico C. Nico C is the Nico comp oh it is Nico main .n. sorry <laughs> they're, two, they're two different things okay so let let me explain the process so how do we get from there to here and to here so I just explained to you that this is how we build this is how we um, this is how we specify where we want to build our project to and where from. So we go from the SRC file, which is this here. So this main.hx file, we specify what the main entry point is, and then we specify where we want to build that project to. The .n file is the bytecode that's generated after we tell the Hex compiler to build to that target. Now, Nico is bytecode, which means that, again, it's very similar to Flash in this regard. It's not quite, it's not exactly the same as Java, but it is similar in certain aspects, such as the virtual machine part. Now, what's interesting to note is that there are two different things, as you just saw. There's Nico and Nico C. There are two completely different things. Now, Nico C takes Nico source code and then generates Nico bytecode. Nico, on the other hand, executes a .n Nico bytecode file. And as you saw, we received that trace, which is on line 10 in main.hx, and it printed out, hello world. Okay. Now, if we were to, like I said, right click on that file and click on execute it just closes immediately no questions asked we don't even get to see that hello world so how do we go about preventing it from closing what we can do is read a character now in programming and this will you'll see this in a lot of programming languages c c++ c sharp is whenever something is printed if you are expected to type something like when a command prompt comes up and you type this command for example when i when this command prompt comes up i type in a command like this for example the program isn't automatically closing right this command prompt isn't automatically closing oops i wasn't meant to do that it's not automatically closing the reason why is because it is waiting for you to do something. The way Windows works is that there's this message system going on in the background, which tells lots and lots of um, that waits for events to be polled to the operating system. And whenever I type in a character in my keyboard, it is sending that information across to the active window, right? In this case, the active window is the, the, this command prompt here. 
and I can now type things in. I can type in lots and lots of different characters. It might not mean anything, but basically what's basically happening is Windows understands all of the different devices that we are connected to, the keyboard, the mouse, etc. And it's taking the information and it's sending it to the active window, which in this case is the command prompt. Now, because that's how the Windows system works, we need to basically tell Windows to keep our window open. But because it requires that an event, that events need to be polled, we need to basically tell Windows somehow to keep that window open. How do we do that? There is a thing called sys.getcar, right? And this will return a character, which is similar to reading. In fact, it is in fact reading. Um, and it will basically print out what we type into the command prompt so now what i'm going to do is i am going to go back into here i'm going to build it again as you saw it was very very quick and now when i go ahead and execute oh oh um, yes of course it's not quite get car i do apologize thinking of something else get car doesn't quite do what we need to do instead what we need to do is std.in which is the standard input i'll talk about this in a bit more detail in a bit and i want to let's just go to read string or we'll say read line Say read line if it's not equal to empty then let's say I am going to create a variable called running just to make it a bit easier to set that true to start with so what what i'm basically going to do is create a while loop and while we're running we want to be checking what the line is so i'll explain all this in a minute so let's save that let's build generated an eco file let's execute another thing that I forgot to do is this false but why it did that I'm not entirely sure execute what it's still closing I'm not entirely sure why okay for some reason it doesn't work in a command prompt when we execute it but it's working here but anyway so the whole point here is to basically emulate the idea that it doesn't close until we enter something So if we now type something, it's going to exit. But if we kept on pressing enter, it will not set running to false, which will go out of this while loop and exit. All right. So that's basically the whole point of that exercise. So the idea of this running loop is to be able to read lines 
that's what we're checking. We're reading the line in the standard input. Now there's different things, there's different um, things in, or concepts, should I say, in Windows once again. In fact, it applies to most operating systems, if not all of them, which is standard input and standard output and also standard error as well, but I'm not going to go into standard error. Um, so what we, what is the difference between the two? So a standard output and standard input, they're both streams, right? Which is basically, um, they're, they're memory blocks that is reserved in memory for the program that's currently running. So when I do this, I have opened both the input and output stream to Windows and I am waiting for input from the user because that is what I'm looking at. I am currently looking at stand, the standard input and I am waiting for the user to create a line, right? I am waiting for the user to create a line. So when I, when I press enter on the keyboard, I have created a line that is then checked. If it's not empty, then running will be set to false. So if I type in any character whatsoever and press enter, it exits. Because I set running to false, it breaks out of the loop, which is this while loop here. Breaking out, you'll, you'll see this quite a lot when I talk computer jargon. Basically breaking out means to effectively step over, well, not really step over, but it means to go out of whatever the looping block is, which is this while loop here, while running. Alternatively, what I can also do is say while true and put in break here, which will break again out of that while loop, right? And then we get we can get rid of this static var running which i would recommend you do probably wondering why so as you can see still going type in the character we exit so why why would we want to do while true instead of while running the reason why is because it is generally bad programming practice to have static variables like running because anyone can access it anyone can access that variable you don't want to as you're programming be accessing a variable by accident and changing it causing the program to close all of a sudden or causing something else to do something else that you didn't want to do because there was a static variable in the same scope with the same name as something else in a different object that you didn't actually add in front saying i want to stop running a specific object in this program instead of the entire program um, so that's why it's generally bad practice to do that because what will generally happen is as i mentioned you will end up in a situation where you might accidentally use a variable that you didn't actually want to access so just to be a bit careful when you start using static variables in certain cases i think it's okay now I'm going to provide you with a demonstration of that just to provide you with what I mean. So let's say we have a class called flags, for example. So we have a series of flags. I'll talk about flags in a later tutorial. But the point being is you might have some static variables that is that says, let's say, flags none which is an int and that is zero and then you have another static variable which then says flags one int is equal to zero times zero one 
This is all hexadecimal notation. You might have flags two, right? Which again could be two, so on and so forth. What now? This is useful for this particular reason. Now, normally what you might do is you might actually add an inline. What that means, oops, was not meant to do that. What that means is instead of having the compiler access the variable, it in fact generates code that is exactly that variable, if that makes sense, on certain targets anyway. So when you put an inline, what you're doing is instead of actually accessing the variable, you're accessing the value directly, if that makes sense. So I'll, I'll, I'll show you. I will show you, and it's probably best if I build to C++ as well to uh, make that a bit... Um, to show you the co the difference between the code generated. So let's go ahead and build another hxml file. I'm going to put in build.hx build-cpp.hxml. Um, get rid of that. I am basically going to copy all of this, but instead of doing Nico, I am going to do dash cpp. I'm going to put in bin slash cpp. So I will build, oh, first of all, I need to actually access it first. So let's trace flags dot flags none, for example. So that'll print out the value zero. So let's go ahead and build that. So let's do hex builds dash hex oops, <laughs> can't do that, get rid of that. So we will build to C++ and we will take a look at the generated code once it's done. As you can see, it is a bit slower than Nico, but it's not too bad. Once it's built, you don't have to go through all of that again. It only builds what you've changed. Okay. So if we now go into the generated files, now this might look alienating to you, but don't worry. So at the moment, we've got this inline variable here. If we go into here, we will take a look for the line that we added that value to, which would be zero. As you can see, we've got that int zero here. This zero character here. So that's what we're getting. We're getting the zero character. Obviously, they generated the flags.hx cpp, no, cpp file, which it didn't really need to do because they're inline variables. But what can you do? <laughs> Nothing's perfect. Um, but if we were to remove that in line, the generated code would be a bit different. So let's go ahead, get rid of those. We build it once again. Yes, I would like to reload. And I am now going to show you what that now looks like. So now we've got a temp one and a temp two. So what does temp one? That is now accessing the variable of flags none. So let's go into flags and see what that variable is. So this is the ver this is the variable declaration, but what is the variable itself? Let's take a look, shall we? Do, 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 do. Somewhere around here. Ah, here we are. So it's down inside boot. It's not 
easy to navigate this code because obviously it's automatically generated but point being instead of accessing the variable directly which is what you would do if you put an inline you instead access the variable itself which then accesses the variable the data that you're actually looking for which in this case is zero so if you were to run that program which would not be Nico, by the way. It would not be Nico. Instead, just double click on that main.exe, and there you go. Hello world, zero. Now, as you can see, <laughs> this is weird. As you can see, that while loop is working inside the CPP, but it doesn't work inside the Nico, <laughs> which is really weird. <laughs> as you can see, it might. I think it's because Windows doesn't understand it, maybe. I'm not 100% sure. But point uh, again, point being, that's how that's how the difference between inline and not inlined variables work. Now, that's a lot of information to take in. So I am going to pause here and I am going to come back with another tutorial and we will go into a bit more detail about the features of Hex. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I will see you next time.